Uh, I will be talking about uh, imaging approach to um, congenital white matter diseases. Um, it's a tough topic uh, and pretty um, complicated, but I'll try to make it as simple as I can and essentially share with you my approach uh, to uh, congenital uh, white matter disease when I look at a case. I'm going to go through um, these four uh, uh, divisions uh, through this lecture. Um, first, uh, we'll look at the normal white matter development, um, and then we'll look at uh, the imaging features of some of the white matter diseases. Um, I'll pick and choose. Uh, uh, obviously, we're not going to discuss all the white matter diseases, yeah, but I'm going to pick some of the common ones or some of the diseases which have a relatively highly specific uh, imaging appearance. And then we'll uh, look at the distinguishing features between these diseases and uh, how imaging can contribute uh, in um, drawing up a differential list. And finally, um, um, we'll summarize uh, with uh, how to approach a case of uh, congenital white matter disease. The normal white matter is located in the central and subcortical regions of the cerebral and cerebellar hemispheres. It accounts for about 60% uh, of the um, total brain volume and includes uh, major commissural tracts, uh, cortical association fibers, and uh, afferent and um, efferent fibers uh, to the cortex. The white matter contains uh, nerve fibers, um, supporting cells, interstitial space, and vascular structures. It consists mostly of axons with their um, envelope of myelin, um, along with uh, um, two types of uh, glial cells, the oligodendrocytes and the astrocytes. The myelin is produced and maintained by the oligodendrocytes. And myelin functions uh, as an insulator of the axons um, and uh, facilitates rapid transmission of impulses um, along the axon and what we call as the uh, saltatory conduction. And when uh, this myelin is disrupted, uh, this transmission of uh, impulses is uh, hindered. So that causes a pathological uh, phenomenon. On imaging, obviously, we're going to talk about MR mostly. I think CT is not that sensitive to detect uh, white matter abnormalities. Uh, on MR, myelin has relatively short T1 and short T2 and um, short T1 relaxation times due to the presence of lipid. Um, there's hyperintensity on T1 weighted images and hypointensity on T2 weighted images uh, relative to the gray matter because of the presence of uh, lipid. And the gray water has uh, more water content, so it is hyperintense on T2 and hyper. The myelination, um, as uh, a baby matures, goes in an orderly fashion, um, and uh, it is important to remember this. Um, at birth, uh, the brainstem uh, shows uh, myelination, uh, and we don't see that elsewhere in the cerebral hemispheres. Um, but slowly, uh, with uh, uh, with growth of the child, myelination progresses. Uh, to the optic radiation and then the splenium of the corpus callosum and then the uh, genu of the corpus callosum followed by the anterior limb of internal capsule and then the frontal white matter and finally the subcortical uh, U fibers or the arcuate fibers. Now, before six months uh, age, um, the T1 weighted images are helpful to determine the uh, myelination uh, whether it is progressing according to normal uh, um, timeline or whether it is delayed. And uh, after six months, the T2-weighted images are helpful. Um, less than six months, initially, by following this algorithmic chart, we can easily see if uh, um, the age, is, uh, age of myelination is appropriate to the, uh, the age of the baby. Um, optic radiation is the first to uh, myelinate, and, uh, um, it myelinates uh, around three to four months, and then the splenium myelinates around uh, four to six months, and the genio 
if it is myelinated, we know that the, child, the age is uh, above six months. Uh, above six months of age, the T2-weighted images are helpful in determining the uh, myelination. Um, myelination tends to lag a little bit um, on T2 compared to T1. So the genu uh, myelinates beyond six months on T1, whereas the splenium, you can see the myelination normally at four to six months, whereas on T2-weighted images, the splenium um, myelinates uh, around six months. pattern. So by two years, the myelination pattern uh, should uh, resemble the adults. We'll look at some of the uh, images. Uh, this is a four-month uh, child, uh, T1-weighted images. Uh, we can clearly appreciate the uh, myelination uh, in the brainstem and the cerebellar white matter. And we can see that the um, internal capsule also shows some myelination, but uh, most of the cerebral hemispheres, you don't see much myelination occurring. Again, here, this image clearly shows myelination occurring around the central sulcus. Um, and one way to remember the order of myelination is uh, to see what uh, function um, matures as a child is growing. Initially, if you see at birth, you can see that the child uh, is recognizing. So the optic radiation is uh, the brainstem and followed by the optic, uh, path, optic radiation is the f uh, first to uh, myelinate. And then uh, as the you know, sensory and the motor functions are, are working, you can see that the myelination is predominantly starting at this, around the um, central focus and then it spreads uh, to the other parts of the brain um, starting again in the occipital lobes and then finally it'll go to the T2-weighted images, same child, uh, four months. You can see the hypointensity of the brainstem and the cerebellar white matter here. And uh, most of the cerebral hemispheres, you see it's unmyelinated. Um, and as you come up around central sulcus, you can see this hypointensity that shows uh, around central sulcus, you can see uh, some myelination. At six months, um, Again, you see a little bit more myelination in the cerebral hemispheres. So you can see a little better. The splenium is uh, myelinated. The genu is, has just begun, so you're just seeing that. Again, on T2, you see T1-weighted images show a little bit better the extent of myelination compared to the T2. T2 still, most of the cerebral hemisphere is uh, showing uh, lack of myelination. Most of it is around the uh, central sulcus. And again, the splenium is showing nicely, hypointensity, that shows it's myelinated. Genu has just begun. Again, coronal images show the same. And at eight months, T2-weighted images, you can see that the splenium is showing nice myelination, hypointensity. Genu is also a little bit more thin now. And you can see much greater myelination you know, through the uh, center and semi veil, you can see uh, not just around the central focus, but it is spreading to other adjacent parts of the brain. And the T1-weighted images, again, largely, they're not very helpful in, in you know, beyond six months uh, to see exactly what structures are myelinating and what not. So it is difficult to use the T1 after six months. At 12 months, you can see there's much greater myelination. Most of the cerebellum is myelinated, the brainstem we have seen earlier, and uh, the internal capsule has myelinated nicely. The genu is myelinated, splenium, very well seen. And most of the cerebral hemispheres um, show myelination except for the uh, subcortical white matter and the frontal lobes. The relatively you know, less myelinated compared to the occipital lobes. Again, same at uh, 12 months, a T1-weighted image. <laughs> 
And this is the adult pattern where you see the myelination going all the way into the subcortical white matter here. Again, you can see it. So all the way it goes. This is the subcortical white matter. And it is important to get, a, get an idea of this and remember this pattern because when you're looking um, at uh, the MR uh, of these patients, you want to know whether the subcortical white matter is normal or whether it is demyelinated. Okay, so if, if that algorithm that I just said, uh, talked about is useful, and, uh, but it is uh, uh, not always uh, possible to remember. Um, it's a good idea to um, look at Barkovich, uh, the pediatric uh, neuroimaging uh, textbook, or any other uh, pediatric uh, textbook. And the, the, uh, the textbook has uh, age-wise uh, images, and you can try to match uh, the patient's uh, images uh, with the textbook, and that will help you, you know, diagnose if the myelination is proceeding normally or if it is delayed. That's the first step. We'll look at some of the imaging features of the common uh, or highly specific uh, white matter diseases. There are hundreds of uh, demyelinating diseases, uh, and it's just uh, even a partial list, and uh, uh, I'm not going to go through these. Um, but it, it nicely uh, shows how varied the pathogenesis and the etiology is for this demyelinating uh, disease. Um, almost uh, every uh, cellular organelle is involved in this abnormality and uh, looks like if it can go wrong, it will. Um, and uh, basically, we can have lysosomal disorders uh, and peroxisomal disorders, mitochondrial dysfunction. We can have DNA abnormalities um, or genes encoding myelin. They can be abnormal. Amino acid uh, metabolism may be abnormal. Urea cycle abnormalities you might see and uh, miscellaneous, which don't fit into any of these categories. So literally, there are hundreds of different types and subtypes and atypical appearance. So it's pretty intimidating, and uh, no wonder uh, most often the MR report that you see for these uh, is just a demyelinating disease. That's it. Um, it's a bit uh, difficult. But uh, that said, out of these hundreds, there are some that have uh, relatively characteristic features, and I'll try to um, show you those. The first one uh, that I'm going to talk about is the metachromatic leukodystrophy. Um, it is the most common inherited leukodystrophy. Um, it, its appearance is not specific. Um, you can suggest, but you can never be definitive on imaging. Um, but I've included it because that's the most common. You're more likely to see this um, compared to the other you know, metabolic uh, leukodystrophies. Um, or inherited leukodystrophy. So we need to know the appearance of the metachromatic because everything else uh, um, is relatively rare and uh, uh, the atypical appearance of this you'll see more common than the other rare ones. Um, this disease is caused uh, by deficiency of the enzyme uh, aryl sulfatase A and because of that there's accumulation of uh, sphingolipid uh, sulfatide. Um, and this is an autosomal recessive disease. Uh, the abnormal gene is on chromosome 22. And uh, there may be, um, there are three forms, the late infantile, the juvenile, and the adult forms uh, based on when it presents. On imaging, there is a progressive uh, symmetric demyelination of the deep hemispheric white matter, the periventricular white matter. That's predominantly involved. And then the change, uh, the demyelination occurs in a centrifugal manner. It spreads uh, from the periventricular region to the uh, subcortical region, which are the last to be involved. The corpus callosum and the pus limb of internal capsule are, are involved. Uh, atrophy is seen in advanced cases, and the cerebellar white matter may or may not be uh, involved. The juvenile and adult forms uh, present a little atypical, so these are late presentations, uh, and they tend to present with frontal lobe involvement, whereas the typical uh, presentation is with uh, occipital predominance. Um, with diffusion weighted images, you might see restricted diffusion. And MR spectroscopy uh, will show elevated choline with a variable increase in myoinositol. Again, non specific. In this MRI uh, flare uh, sequence, uh, we see these images showing uh, extensive uh, demyelination in the white matter of both cerebral hemispheres. But uh, it is not involving the subcortical sub arcuate fibers. Um, 
you'll have to see um, um, sub, uh, Kahneman's disease or other disease that involves, I'll show later, uh, the subcortical fibers and, and to appreciate the sparing of the subcortical fibers in this. Otherwise, it is pretty nondescript. There's no mass effect. It doesn't enhance. It is pretty symmetric. And uh, the differential uh, is uh, HIV uh, look encephalopathy because that you tend to see more often. Um, and um, so before you label it as a you know, metachromatic look, just make sure um, if it's an adult especially, um, see if there's any HIV um, history. Mucopolysaccharidosis uh, is another interesting entity. Um, it is not a single entity. It is um, there are nine different types um, based on the enzyme deficiencies and inheritance pattern. Um, inheritance, uh, most of them are by autosomal recessive except for the type 2, which is the hunters. And that is uh, or, um, x linked or recessive, so it uh, is seen in males. And there are different enzymes that are deficient uh, leading to accumulation of the mucopolysaccharides, and that accumulation causes problems. Imaging features tend to be similar in all the subtypes of mucopolysaccharidosis. Um, there are multiple small cystic lesions in the parietal and occipital white matter. And these cystic lesions are basically um, deposition, caused by deposition of the mucopolysaccharides in the um, perivascular spaces. So they tend to be radially oriented, depending on how you image, or sometimes they're cystic or radially oriented, um, depending on the axis. Corpus callosum is involved, uh, there's delayed myelination, and uh, you tend to see confluent myelination and cerebral atrophy. Dural thickening is an important feature of this uh, group, uh, especially you see it in the cervical occipital region, and there may be cord compression in some of the patients. Um, the type 4 mucopolysaccharidosis, which is a morchios, it uh, has uh, atlantoaxial subluxation that adds to cord compression. And uh, don't forget to look at the um, thoracic spine uh, or uh, these spine lumbar spine images, uh, x-rays, uh, you might see gibbous uh, kyphosis in them and some vertebral anomalies that are typical for mucopolysaccharidosis. Basal ganglia lesions, the cystic lesions that I talked about, um, they are seen in the, uh, more, more commonly with the type 1 and the type 2 mucopolysaccharidosis, the hurler and the hunter, there is a predominance of the basal ganglia lesions, so that can help. And this is a characteristic uh, typical appearance uh, of uh, type 1 or type 2 mucopolysaccharidosis where you have the cystic lesions involving the basal ganglia. These are all worker robin spaces, perivascular spaces where the mucopolysaccharides are deposited and you see demyelination. Another patient with uh, type 4 mucopolysaccharidosis, you see um, this dural thickening at the craniovertebral junction anteriorly and posteriorly. And in addition, there is also atlantic axial subluxation because of which there's narrowing and there's compression of the cord. Zellweger syndrome is another rare um, uh, um, leukodystrophy. It is a paroxysmal disorder, but it has a characteristic appearance. So it's good to remember. Uh, it is an autosomal recessive disorder. It may be caused by absence of normal paroxysomes or due to defective functioning of uh, multiple paroxysmal enzymes. Um, imaging shows, in addition to demyelination, uh, neuronal migration abnormalities, which may be in the form of pachygyria or gray matter heterotopia or perisylvian polymicrogyria. On CT, um, again, the white matter is hypodense, but there's some uh, sulcation abnormalities you can see here around the cilium fissures. Uh, this is probably due to polymicrogyria. You see it a little better with uh, MRI, T2-weighted MRI. There's diffuse um, demyelination, both cerebral hemispheres. And uh, here you can see the polymicrogyria. So demyelination with polymicrogyria, uh, remember Zellweger syndrome, uh, I think another um, there is also, uh, there are also, it's not pathognomonic, there are also other things, there are other conditions that can cause that, but this is the most important one to be associated with this. X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy is also another important condition to know. It's a paroxysmal disorder. Um, it is the most common single protein or enzyme deficiency disease to present in childhood. Uh, it is X-linked recessive, so it is seen almost exclusively in boys. Uh, it is caused by mutation in the gene ABCD1. And uh, there's a defect in um, ATP binding um, transporter in peroxisomal membrane because of which there's impaired beta oxidation of the very long chain fatty acids. And uh, 
the, there is accumulation of the very long chain fatty acids, which causes inflammation and demyelination. Um, there are two types. The childhood onset is the most common, and the adult onset uh, is the less common one. That is also called as the adrenomyeloneuropathy. And as the name suggests, there's a predominance of adrenal um, insufficiency and uh, spinal cord uh, involvement with the adult onset variety. The adrenal insufficiency may occur uh, before the onset of neurological symptoms, so that's important to know. In patients presenting with adrenal insufficiency, you need to think about X-linked uh, adrenal leukodystrophy. An interesting aside to this, um, uh, Lorenzo's oil is one of the treatments for this X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, and um, it's a, there's an interesting story to how this oil was uh, found out. It was not found out by doctors or researchers. It was actually found by uh, parents of a child who was afflicted with X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. The boy's name um, is Lorenzo. So in his name, the parents uh, have, uh, who have this, uh, found this out, they have named it as Lorenzo's oil. And uh, before this, there was no treatment at all. And even now it is used, um, basically this uh, Lorenzo's oil is a mixture, it is a mixture of uh, predominantly saturated fatty acids, and this mixture is supposed to inhibit competitively the uh, very long-chain fatty acids, and thereby decreasing the levels of very long-chain fatty acids in the plasma, and hopefully it was felt that that will protect. Um, but um, recent studies have shown that uh, it, it has not been very helpful um, in, in symptomatic patients, but in um, asymptomatic patients, uh, if this oil is given, it has delayed the onset of symptoms. So to some extent, uh, it, it may be helpful uh, before the patients become symptomatic. And uh, again, this is a very, very, uh, if any, any of you are interested, you can, th there's a movie made out of this story um, by Nick Nolte and uh, Susan Sarandon. Uh, it's a very interesting movie. You should look at it. At least it shows the level of activism in, in some parents and, and what it has done to drive the research uh, into, into some of these diseases. Very engaging movie. Uh, imaging features of this disease, uh, initially you see extensive uh, symmetric demyelination in the occipital white matter bilaterally, and then it tends to spread in the frontal direction, and uh, uh, there may be enhancement of the leading margin. Um, very few diseases, uh, white matter disease, have enhancement, so this is one of those. Um, arcuate fibers tend to be spared. Um, corpus callosum, thalamus, and external capsules are involved. There may be calcification or cavitation sometimes. And uh, in adrenomyeloneuropathy, which is the adult uh, onset variant, um, there's a predominance of lesions in the cerebellum and in the spinal cord and in the corticospinal tracts. In diffusion-weighted imaging, there is diffusion restriction in the zone of enhancement, and MR spectroscopy will show uh, decreased uh, NS style aspartate even in normally appearing white matter. And there's non-specific elevation of choline and myonisetol and lactate, which can be seen in any other disease of the white matter. And there's a typical uh, appearance uh, on MR. You see proton density image and uh, contrast enhanced T1 weighted image. Proton density, you see this demyelination in the occipital lobes predominantly. And in post contrast, uh, you see this enhancement of the leading edge. Uh, that's a very characteristic MR appearance. And you see involvement of the spinium as well. The next disease uh, we'll talk about is the cerebrotendinous xanthomatosis. It is an autosomal recessive disease caused by lack of activity of the mitochondrial enzyme. So it's a mitochondrial disease. There are several mitochondrial abnormalities. This is one of those. Uh, the enzyme 27-hydroxylase is, is, is uh, abnormal, because of which there is increased uh, serum cholesterol um, and deposition of this uh, cholesterol in tissues that causes abnormalities. Um, children present with borderline or low intelligence uh, from birth, and they also have associated cataracts or xanthomas in the tendons. Uh, that's why the name cerebrotendinous xanthomatosis. And uh, uh, they also have cerebellar, pyramidal, and sensory tract signs. There may be cerebellar white matter demyelination. Um, again, not many diseases have uh, cerebellar predominance. This is one of those, so good to remember. And lesions uh, may be surrounded by a hypo-intense rim on T2-weighted images. Um, again, that is because of the deposition of the lipid and also because of hemocedrin. Um, there is variable periventricular demyelination, and uh, lesions uh, may be seen in the globus pallidus. Um, hypo-intense lesions are noted uh, in cerebral peduncles and uh, 
Um, this hypointensity is because of the deposition of xanthomatter. In this example here, MR of the ankle, it shows uh, uh, thickening of the Achilles tendon. Again, very important uh, uh, feature for diagnosis. And on the T2 weighted, you see lesions in the, in the uh, um, cerebral peduncles. And in the cerebellar hemispheres, you see these uh, cavitating lesions with some hypo-intense rim around it because of the xanthomata deposition. And here, I think this is probably because of xanthomata and probably hemosiderin deposition around these cavitating lesions. So again, very uh, characteristic uh, MR appearance for this. Lay's disease is another mitochondrial disease. It is also called as a subacute uh, necrotizing encephalitis. Uh, it can be uh, inherited either autosomal recessive or through maternal inheritance, um, and it is caused by several uh, deficiencies of several mitochondrial enzymes. Um, these include the pyruvate dehydrogenase or the cytochrome oxidase. Um, there may be childhood, uh, juvenile, or adult onset forms, and uh, patients tend to have elevated levels of lactate and pyruvate in the blood. On imaging, we see delayed myelination in childhood, and lesions uh, may be focal or diffuse in the white matter, and they tend to be symmetrical. Characteristically, the putamen, the corded nucleus, are commonly involved. Um, again, this is a very characteristic feature. Not many other diseases do that. Lesions may involve uh, the globus pallidus, the dentate nucleus, substantia nigra, and the red nucleus, so all the deep nuclei may be involved. Thalamus, uh, hypothalamus, and corticus, uh, cortex are less often involved. Uh, and cerebral atrophy may be seen in long-standing cases. This is a typical appearance, uh, proton density weighted images showing these hyperintense lesions involving the caudate head and the putamen. And on the side of the images, we see cerebellar atrophy. Again, one of the few diseases where you have a cerebellar atrophy. So this is a very good combination where you see basal ganglia lesions uh, hyperintense with, uh, with some demyelination and cerebral atrophy, then you think about Lynch disease. Kern sire is another mitochondrial disease, um, um, relatively characteristic in appearance. It is a sporadic disease. This is not inherited. It is uh, sporadic uh, caused uh, due to deletion of uh, mitochondrial DNA. Um, and uh, early development is normal, but uh, later um, children present with ptosis or chronic external ophthalmoplegia. And there may be associated pigmental retinal detachment or cardiac uh, conduction defects, um, delayed psychomotor development, proximal myopathy, and endocrine disease. On imaging, uh, we see calcification in the globus pallidus and cardiac nucleus. Um, again, that some of the white matter diseases have calcifications. This is one of those. Um, there may be symmetrical hyperintense lesions on T2 uh, in the globus pallidus, the caudate, and the subcortical white matter. Um, thalamus and substantia nigra may also be involved. Um, periventricular white matter and the corpus callosum and internal capsules are spared. Uh, cerebellar white matter is involved. So most of the white mitochondrial diseases, they tend to involve the cerebellum. So that's good to remember. In this patient, you see calcification in the caudate nucleus, and on the MR, you see um, most of the demolition involving the cerebellum. So that's um, current sire. MELAS is an uh, interesting uh, mitochondrial disease. It stands for mitochondrial uh, myopathy, um, encephalopathy, uh, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episode syndrome. Um, again, it is inherited through maternal transmission because of the mitochondrial uh, um, abnormality. Um, there's a mutation of mitochondrial DNA that codes for the tRNA. Um, that's the cause for that. And uh, these patients present with uh, limb weakness and uh, stroke-like features, and they have uh, lactic acidosis. They may have calcification in globus pallidus and caudic nucleus. They tend to have stroke-like lesions which do not follow the vascular territories. Um, predominantly, the lesions are seen in the occipital and posterior temporal lobes. Uh, cortex is relatively more involved than the white matter. And the enhancement may be seen in acute or subacute stages. Um, atrophy is seen in chronic stages, and MR spectroscopy will show increased lactate. In this patient with malas, you see calcifications in the basal ganglia, and all these uh, stroke-like lesions involving the occipital and parietal lobes. On MR, again, we have T1-weighted and proton-density-weighted images. We see this area of chronic infarct. Um, 
Again, you'll have to look at all the images to see whether the um, infarct is involving a typical territory. In case of MILAS and MRF, which is, again, the imaging features overlap in MRF, um, again, the uh, infarcts tend to cross uh, arterial territories. Cocaine's disease uh, is uh, another disease uh, um, that uh, is caused by a defect in the repair of DNA. It is autosomal recessive disease, and uh, on CT you may see calcification in the basal ganglia, the dentate nucleus, and subcortical area. So again, one of those uh, demyelinating diseases that is associated with um, um, calcifications. On MR imaging, you will see um, cerebral or cerebellar and brainstem atrophy and symmetric uh, hyperintense signal in the cerebral deep white matter due to demyelination. This is a good example where you see extensive calcification um, in the cerebellum as well as the basal ganglia and in the subcortical white matter you can see here, in addition to the demyelination in cerebral hemispheres, a bit hard to see on the CT scan. But again, such extensive calcifications Think of uh, cocaines. MR showing this extensive demyelination. And on sagittal, you see cerebellar uh, hypoplasia. Pelizaris Merzbacher disease uh, uh, is another very interesting uh, imaging appearance. Um, it, it is an X linked uh, recessive uh, disease. Uh, so that means mostly um, men are involved, uh, boys and men uh, express this disease. It is caused by uh, a defective gene that encodes proteolipid. Um, because of that, you see demyelination. Uh, on CT and MRI, there's a demyelination and delayed myelination. So there's lack of progression, or sometimes you might see complete absence of myelination. And there are scattered irregular areas of uh, myelin preservation, which gives a characteristic tigroid appearance. Um, that is, again, whenever you see that, think of palisades. And there may be cerebral atrophy. Here we have the T1 weighted and T2 weighted images showing this extensive demyelination throughout the cerebral hemispheres. But you have these, uh, you know, layers uh, or areas of islands of uh, preserved myelination. So that gives this tigroid appearance to this. And whenever you see that, uh, think of this. It is not pathognomonic. Uh, some other diseases also can show um, the uh, metachromatic leukodystrophy. Sometimes can show this appearance, but it is uh, very uh, characteristic of pelisades. Kahneman's disease is a disorder of amino acid metabolism. It's an example of that, and it is an autosomal recessive disease. It's caused due to decreased activity of uh, aspartoacylase, the enzyme, and uh, there is mutation in the, the ASPA gene, which uh, causes abnormal accumulation of the NSL aspartate. This is the only identified genetic disorder that is caused by a defect in a metabolite that is produced exclusively in the brain. So all the other disorders are more systematic. I mean, you see um, abnormalities involving the other organ systems, but the Kahneman's is one it exclusively uh, involves the brain because the NSTL aspartate is, uh, is limited to the brain. Um, there may be congenital or infantile varieties based on their onset. And uh, this disease is more common in Nazi Jews and in Saudi Arabians. Um, children tend to be normal at birth and present at six months with the accumulation of this uh, uh, metabolite. There is decreased uh, motor development uh, and uh, patients have spasticity in macrocephaly. That's another important uh, distinguishing feature. Uh, we'll talk about it. Very few uh, white matter diseases have macrocephaly. Large head is one of those. Children may have uh, nystagmus and blindness and uh, they tend to die by 40 years of age. On imaging, there, is, there, there are diffuse confluence symmetrical lesions. Um, the cerebral and cerebellar subcortical white matter is involved. That's an important uh, distinguishing feature. Most of the white matter diseases start in the periventricular, but Kahneman's, on the other hand, starts in subcortical region. And this has a centripetal uh, progression. That means disease starts in the subcortical region and then progresses into the deep periventricular region. Um, there may be bilateral lesions involving the globus pallidus, and uh, caudate and putamen tend to be spared. Calamus is involved. Internal capsule tends to be spared. Most of the disease will involve internal capsule, but uh, Kahneman's will spare internal capsule. In late stages, you will see atrophy. And MR spectroscopy is uh, nearly pathognomonic because it shows elevated NSL aspartate peak. And this is, one of, this is the only one um, that causes elevation of NAA peak, so that's almost diagnostic.
And uh, here we see extensive uh, demyelination of the um, cerebral hemispheres. And you can see that this white matter abnormality goes all the way, all the way. And if you remember the metachromatic leukodystrophy, the first one that I showed, that doesn't go into this subcortical region, so the periphery here. And this is a typical of the subcortical involvement, where you see this white matter going all the way, the abnormality going all the way to the cortex, to the surface. So this is Kahneman's disease. Alexander's disease um, is a non-familial sporadic disease. It is caused by a mutation in the GFAP gene, which is the glial fibrillary um, acidic protein um, uh, encoding gene. And uh, because of that, this, uh, uh, this filament protein is expressed only in astrocytes. And because of this defect, there are innumerable Rosenthal fibers that are deposited throughout the central nervous system, um, and uh, that causes a pathology. Um, there are three forms, the infantile, juvenile, or adult presentation. Um, infantile form onset uh, is at six months, and these uh, children also present with uh, enlarged head, megalencephaly. So again, we saw Kahneman's uh, has enlarged head, and Alexander's is another one that you think of whenever the head is enlarged. They have um, developmental retardation, and they may have raised intracranial pressure. On imaging, you see bilateral, asymmetrical, well-demarcated areas of demyelination in frontal lobes, extending into the temporal and parietal lobes. Again, this is an important characteristic. Most of the diseases, they you know, start you know, in the parietal occipital region and then spread to the frontal later. But uh, Alexander's disease is one that occurs predominantly in the frontal lobes and then uh, extends uh, into the temporal and parietal lobes. There's relative sparing of the occipital lobes. The arcuate fibers are involved. Uh, internal capsule is spared, just like Kahneman's. And there tends to be mass effect. Most demyelinating diseases, they don't have mass effect, but Alexander's disease can have mass effect. On imaging, ventricles may enlarge due to atrophy. Um, and uh, interestingly, there may be increased density in, on CT in the subpile and subapenamal regions and in the frontal um, and occipital white matter. Uh, you don't see that in other white matter diseases. And there may be enhancement in the acute or subacute stages. Again, that's interesting. A feature which you don't see in other uh, many other um, white matter diseases, and cerebellum tends to be spared. In the typical uh, example where you see predominance of uh, frontal lobe involvement, you see this demyelination. You don't see much abnormality posteriorly, and on CT you see a little bit of hyperdense areas that tend to enhance with contrast injection. So this is another characteristic. If you see frontal lobe predominance and enhancement, then you think of Alexander's disease, especially with uh, enlarged uh, head. Now I've uh, seen only some. I've shown only some of the uh, some of these diseases. Now um, let's look at how to go about um, gathering a differential diagnosis when you have a you know, demyelinating uh, um, case. Um, some diseases have relatively characteristic appearance. A majority of them don't. There's a lot of uh, overlap in, in the appearance. Differentiation in general is easier in the early stage of the disease. So you, uh, if you have a, uh, a MR for interpretation, always make sure you get the uh, earlier studies. The earliest possible, the better, to distinguish. In later stages, when everything is uh, abnormal, it's, it is hard to distinguish. Now, what are the discriminating factors that can help you in generating a differential? Um, the regional distribution, um, frontal or parietal or occipital, uh, sparing of certain structures like internal capsule, um, involvement of certain structures like subcortical white matter, that gives you clues. Symmetry gives you a clue, asymmetry or symmetrical. Um, contrast enhancement, that gives you clues. Calcification, some diseases have it. Um, and uh, any other associated abnormalities? like the vertebral anomalies we talked about, gray matter involvement, that can give you uh, some limited differential, migration anomalies, very few um, diseases will have, craniovertebral junction anomalies, and other systemic features like adrenal abnormalities, cardiac abnormalities, like that. So if you have all, look for those, and then uh, based on that, you can generate a differential, and, uh, and that'll help you shorten the list. Let's look at uh, some of these uh, uh, and see what kind of differential we're looking at. Um, diseases uh, with complete or near complete lack of myelination, that means extensive demyelination in the entire cerebral hemispheres. Um, Kahneman's disease tends to present with that, Pelizaeus disease, and 18Q minus syndrome. These are the most uh, common ones with 
complete lack of myelination. General distribution, if you see, some diseases begin in the subcortical white matter. These are the Kahneman's disease, the amino acidopathies, and the organic acidurias. Whenever you see subcortical beginning of pathology, think of these. Disease is uh, predominantly in the frontal lobe, again, Alexander's disease. Diseases that have predominant cerebellar involvement, think of uh, cerebellar tendinous xanthomatosis, uh, adenomyelineuropathy, Refson's disease, and also the mitochondrial myelopathies, uh, you will see. The pattern of disease spread gives you a clue. If the disease is spreading from posterior to anterior, I mean, as you're looking at the serial uh, MRIs, you see how is the disease progressing from frontal to occipital or occipital to uh, frontal. X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy spreads posterior to anterior, whereas Alexander's disease spreads anterior to posterior. You see centripetal spread in Kahneman's disease and centrifugal spread. Most of them spread centrifugal, and uh, the typical one example is the metachromatic leukodystrophy. Lesion symmetry. Most inherited white metal uh, diseases are symmetric. Um, and some of the toxic uh, di uh, disease, metabolic diseases like carbon monoxide and cyanide poison, they, they can be symmetric, but most of the um, acquired ones are asymmetric. Um, and some acquired, like the periventricular leukomalacia, Binswanger's, HIV, they can be symmetric. So remember that. ADEM and PML tend to be asymmetric. These are important differential you know, to consider whenever you see demyelinating disease. We're, we're talking about congenital demyelinating disease today, but, but always um, the acquired demyelinating disease also is in the differential. We need to remember that. Um, lesion confluence. Uh, confluence disease uh, it tends to um, be seen with X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, metachromatic leukodystrophy, Alexander's and Kahneman's disease. And in white matter disease, this is acquired secondary to radiotherapy or chemotherapy. So lesions basically start individual, but they tend to coalesce and enlarge. Um, there's a mixture of confluent and discrete lesions in case of multiple sclerosis and Binswanger's disease. These are not congenital, but acquired lesions. What are the diseases where you see enhancing lesions? Um, again, think of uh, X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, um, Alexander's disease. Again, these are multiple sclerosis and variants, shoulders, bolus, and ADM, uh, and multiple. So they tend to enhance. But in the congenital white matter diseases, think of X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy and Alexander's disease. White matter diseases that are associated with uh, gray matter lesions, um, think of uh, mitochondrial diseases. Whenever you see uh, the basal ganglia or other deep nuclei involved, think of mitochondrial disease. And then the acquired diseases like Binswanger's, the vasculitis, uh, uh, glutaric, uh, these are congenital again, glutaric and other organic acidurias, and the toxic encephalopathies tend to have white matter lesions, gray matter lesions along with white matter. Some diseases have high density lesions in the basal ganglia on CT. So think of a Krabs disease, a GM2 gangliosidosis, and Farr's disease. And uh, white matter disease associated with macrocephaly. We know Kahneman's and Alexander's and also mucopolysaccharidosis, Hurley's and Hunter's, and also the multiple sulfatase deficiency. So these are the diseases that are associated with macrocephaly. What are the diseases associated with CV junction abnormalities? The Hurler's, Morchios, and multiple sulfatase disease. And the diseases associated with neuronal migration abnormalities, we have the Zellweger's, cerebrohepatorenal syndrome, and the congenital muscular dystrophy. These two are the more common ones. Diseases associated with thalamic lesions, I have Krabbe's disease, GM2 gangliosidosis, Wilson's disease, and neuronal steroid lipofusinosis. Diseases associated with uh, cerebral parenchymal calcifications. Again, we have seen some examples, the Cocaine's disease, X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, mitochondrial disease, a lot of them have, a malignant filin, ketonuria, and this is an acquired differential where you have white matter disease secondary to radiotherapy or chemotherapy. Now here's a list of uh, diseases where the MR pattern is a relatively specific, high specificity. And it is good to remember these, and uh, the others, uh, it is difficult to um, you know, um, give, a different, give a clue based on imaging. But at least these we need to uh, remember.
and identify the you know pathological uh, appearance. So these are the Alexander's disease, the Kahneman's, the cerebellar tendinous xanthomatosis, Kern's sire, glutaric aciduria, periventricular leukomelia. This is acquired. Toxic encephalopathy is again acquired. X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy and Zellweger's. Now, how, how do I approach a case of congenital white matter disease? Initially, you need to look at the MR and, and see uh, whether there is delayed myelination or demyelination, uh, dysmyelination, based on the um, algorithmic approach that I um, showed at the beginning. Uh, once you have uh, looked at either, you, I, mean, I, I would, I would um, encourage, uh, uh, if you have the question to, you know, pull out Barkovich or any of these pediatric neuroimaging books and look at the images and, and, and see whether it is delayed or not. And once you have made that uh, call that there is delayed myelination, then um, you look at the neurodevelopmental history, you'll get clues sometimes, um, clinical features you need to know, family history is important, lab findings, uh, lactic acidosis, uh, long chain fatty acids, things like that, and uh, sometimes they may have uh, biopsies, that's important. And always remember to get the prior studies because the earlier study um, will give you more distinguishing features. The later you image, the more the overlap between these uh, conditions and the more harder to come up with um, a good uh, differential. And then finally, with the differentiating features uh, that we discussed, uh, you try to generate a differential and, and, and uh, discuss with the clinician to see if uh, uh, they can help you know, in narrowing down the differential. And finally, last but not the least, do not forget to think about the acquired uh, demyelinating diseases, either to include in the differential or to exclude them. And finally, these diseases, they have so many overlapping features. Um, don't, don't shoot from your head and, and, and jump at a diagnosis, but always, these are so rare, and it's even, uh, even experienced neuroradiologists, they don't see very often. So it's always a good idea to consult uh, Barkovich Neuroimaging, which is an excellent resource, or Van der Knapp, uh, textbook. Van der Knapp has written an excellent book. Everybody refers to it. It is called as the Magnetic Resonance of Myelin, Myelination, and Myelin Disorders. You'll see all kinds of variants and all that. So if ever you have a question, you can, you can look at that. Um, and that, that's a great help. And uh, with this, um, uh, we come to the end of this lecture. Uh, thank you all for, for, for um, listening to the lecture. And I wish to acknowledge the help uh, uh, from uh, Dr. Bazan and Dr. Jenkins, who are my mentors at the University of Texas, for sharing their, um, their teaching material. Um, these cases are pretty rare, and it'll take a lifetime to see uh, many of these. Um, thank you all.